Another episode of Shifted Ed. Um, we're coming in from Learn Quebec here, and I'm reaching out to um, a Canadian across the way, George Kouros, who has come in to talk to us a little bit about education, ed tech, change, shifting practices, yeah. and on and on and on. So, George, welcome uh, to our, our our humble podcast here. Yeah, well, I and Chris, thanks for thanks for having me. I don't I don't know if you know this based on the introduction, but I I am from uh, originally from a small town in uh, Saskatchewan, and unfortunately, everybody knows it because of a tragedy that happened there. It's Humboldt, Saskatchewan, which I'm right. very proud to be of that town. And then I lived in Alberta for the last 20 years. Uh, but my family and I we moved to Orlando, Florida. So I don't know if you know that. So I'm I'm I'm, well, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you out of uh, Florida right now. Uh, Lucky man, harsh, <laughs> and I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> if I never see snow ever again, you know, I, yeah, I miss the people, we, but I do not miss the snow. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, yeah. We just thought we escaped winter, right? We were like, oh wow, nice spring's here, and uh, the last two days have just been atrocious. Like winter came back with a punch to the nose. Well, so if, we're up here really in cold really, <laughs> Montreal. Yeah, if you really want to, I escaped winter. Right, forever. So I just <laughs> right. I escaped winter. It's and, possible. And we've been here. We've been here long enough. Where you know, it's uh, I think it's twenty five degrees out, and I'm wearing a hoodie. So I'm like, what is wrong awesome. with me? But yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. great. Yeah. Good. I love it. So George, why don't we start off just with a little bit of history of sure. your history? How did you get into, you know, helping teachers and helping administrators kind of look. At, through different lenses um, of education, how did how did that all come to be for you? Well, it's interesting interesting because I've had very you know different roles. I actually trained to become a kindergarten teacher and had a kindergarten um, interview and thought I actually crushed it. This is my very first interview in education, and they seemed to really like me. And then they said, "Hey, we we decided to go with someone else," and I was like, oh, "That's weird." Like I you know I was like you know pretty confident. They seemed really appreciative and then I called them about two weeks after and I said hey like I'm new to the profession I'm trying to get better and they said well actually um we were going to call you today because we wanted to offer you a high school technology position so mm -hmm. I was like really so it was interesting because the interview went really well I had made like a website in university I went to University of Saskatchewan and they kept asking me about it over and over again and so based on the interview they knew they were going to have a high school technology um position open right. but they couldn't they couldn't advertise it yet and so they kept asking me because they're like this is the guy this is the guy and and it was like amazing because i had such a little knowledge of technology but a little knowledge of technology in 1999 was an abundance right like i was like <laughs> way ahead of people at the time so the, i you know i i took the job a little bit reluctantly because i'm like i am not prepared to teach high school and uh i actually remember I, I talked to my my cooperating teacher she said take the job which is fascinating because like we have a teacher shortage and it, at that time it was like you'll be lucky if you get a job like how all right. the world has changed <laughs> and uh i took it basically saying like i don't even know what I, like i do not understand the content i would teach so i would go in like a little bit earlier in the day than when school started and then i actually you know I would learn the stuff about an hour ahead of what I, when I was supposed to teach it. And it was really, um, it was a really good experience for me because in the classroom, uh, you know, we're learning technologies and you can have a, a massive amount of knowledge, but there's way more that you don't know. And that's reality. So I would say to the students in high school, I'm like, Hey, does anyone know how to do this? And they're like, I do, I do. <laughs> so it really kind of put me in a space where immediately I was very comfortable learning from other people including right. my students and it's something that's and you you see when you actually create a space where students feel that they have something to contribute to the space that they actually make not only the other students but the teacher better um mm -hmm. how much more empowered they feel and how much better of an experience that is so that actually just shifted and then i i took that you know very temporary job and then i actually ended up teaching elementary for school and took that mentality. So I, I've really, you know, even in my, like, I'm not in the classroom right now. I'm not in school. I'm uh, independent in my work. Um, but my mentality is I don't ever talk about teaching because I do not feel it's my place to tell mm -hmm. teachers how to teach, but I do talk about learning and that's in all aspects of our lives. And I, I always default to the people that I work with. 
Um, like I'm not the expert. I'm just a, a guy sharing ideas. Um, you are the ones who are to find the solution because you know your community better. You know who this is. And so, uh, you know, I've done basically K-12 taught their vice principal, principal, central office. And, and then uh, and now I have the blessing to work all over the world and uh, and work with schools, work with organizations, work outside. And there's like actually a lot of uh, businesses that I'm starting to work with because right. COVID said, hey, like, we need to figure out how to learn and who better to um, teach people how to learn than educators. And I, I'm very right. proud that we've always looked at in education, we've always looked to business and try to learn from them. But the, the adverse hasn't been true. And I think businesses are starting to say like, Hey, we need to like, see what education do because they're the experts in learning. So that, right. that's right. the, so that's the focus. So yeah, I've kind of, yeah. kind of been all over the place. I, I actually liken myself to, um, you, you see, I have some Canadian roots, the the littlest hobo. <laughs> Do you remember that show? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I kind of go into a place, <laughs> hopefully make it better, and then leave pretty quick. <laughs> and it's like, where's that dog going? <laughs> uh, Off to a new adventure. <laughs> Off to a new adventure. Yeah. Who knows where the episode is, yeah. So yeah. I, I appreciate that I could tell that story because I've tried to share that in the U.S. and nobody knows what I'm talking about. But I know people oh. here will understand that story. It's that's warm to our right. heart for sure. Uh, yeah. If you if you well, don't know the if you don't know the theme of Lilas Hobo and you're Canadian, I you know I, I've lost a yeah, little respect got, for you. You got troubles. Yeah. <laughs> so George, I know a lot of your work also deals with help helping change occur yeah. um, from from the top levels all the way down. Yeah. Now, what's your viewpoint on the system that education is in the sense that it's really slow to change yep. um when you look at the big picture of it all um you know we we tend to do what we've done for the past you know since the industrial uh, revolution um where do you start um supporting systems that want to change yep. but just aren't sure how to go about doing it yeah I, I think one of the things right away is a conversation about like a lot of people blame the system like it's the wizard of oz like it's someone standing behind a curtain yeah. and we have no say and right. getting people to understand like hey you are the system like because it, it, it's like it's easy like uh to say like oh i you know i've seen you know superintendents director generals say like oh i wish we could do this i'm like you're the, you're the literal boss so <laughs> right. like like what, what are you talking about right and, and you know and kind of sharing this and so I actually think the one of the biggest issues, and I don't, I don't want to say issues, but obstacles we face is mm -hmm. we are really trying to t change the experience for students in the classroom, but then mm -hmm. we are really holding on to old aspects of leadership. And, you know, I, I have tons of conversations with like state, provincial level organizations, and they're like, we really want our teachers to, you know, try different things, be open to taking risks. I'm like, okay, so let's talk about your event. Like, so I'm coming to speak at your event. So I know you've tr traditionally done this and you have this kind of schedule. You do this, you do this. How about we change this? No, 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 no. I'm like, this is the issue is that you're asking people to change, but you're saying, but it has to be within the parameters of the things that we've always done. So how do we actually, for example, change the experience of, you know, teachers for their own learning, right? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? So like really quick example. Let's say you go to a conference. Typically, people go to conferences. They actually, you know, have a keynote. And then 15 minutes, you got to get to your next session because we got to like fill that day with learning. And then, you know, you might have a 10 minute break. You might get 30 minutes for lunch. Blah blah blah. And it's like the same. Like, what what if you actually had an event where someone was speaking? Because I think content's really important. Mm -hmm. And then you actually gave people like 35, 40 minutes to talk to have conversations mm -hmm. about it to actually dig in. And you know, like one of the things that I've done for years I've, I've worked at conferences and you know people say i'll say what was the best part of that event it was a conversation in the hallway with my colleagues right mm -hmm. then we don't actually intentionally make that time so if you really want things to change the classroom we have to think about how they change at the administrator level and that's a lot of my work right now is actually getting them to look at you know how what are what are some of the problems that we're complaining about that we're also creating so for example mental health huge thing, right? So mm -hmm. what have leaders done? They're like, Hey, we're going to take a PD day. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to do like our learning and stuff like that. And then we're going to have a yoga class, you mm -hmm. know, to alleviate some of your stress. And it's like, Hey, 
why don't you actually just not cause the problem? <laughs> and then so I don't have to do yoga. So like, why don't we look at what's causing the problem instead of like saying, hey, we're causing this problem and here's an hour of yoga to, <laughs> to solve it. It's like, yeah, ah, yeah. I, I'm not a big yoga person. Can we just <laughs> fix a problem? So I, I think that I think that to me is like, you know, I, I, I truly believe, and, you know, I believe teachers, you know, so close to kids are the most important aspect of, you know, uh, of education, obviously, but if your leadership is bad, that's where a lot of problems stem because your, your great teachers end up leaving or getting worse. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, the ones that aren't necessarily as great tend to stay. Um, and yeah. you know, and I don't think anyone does better from that. So I think it is, it yeah. is, it is a leadership issue and, you know, bombardment of initiatives and, you know, we try to, we want to be on the cutting edge of everything. So we, in that when we try everything new and we don't actually focus on what we've done in the past to become better at that, that causes some of the issues as well. For sure. Um, and George, like what, what makes kids learn better? Um, what kind of environments are created? Cause I mean, a question to you as well is like ki kids tend to all, I mean, kids learn, have learned the way they've learned from the dawn of time, right? Like, sure. how, do you think that kids nowadays learn differently than they did 20, 30, 40 years ago? I, I don't think, I don't necessarily think they've learned differently. I think they have access to different things, right? right. And so, it, it, you know, think about, and I'm, you know, I'm dating myself here. I'm 48 years old and, uh, you know, the, we'd have, hey, don't like, hey, you got to do some more homework and math, but don't look at the back. Right. You know, like don't, don't copy the answers in the back and then you'd copy the answers in the back because you had to get your homework done. <laughs> and so why would you do that? Cause you never, as a student, you didn't see the value. Like right. if you didn't see the value of something then you, but now it's not, you don't have to worry about looking in the back. They can just do a chat GPT, this AI thing, blah, blah, blah. So again, if they don't see the value of it, you know, like I, I still actually write my own blog and not many people have blogs anymore. And I don't write it because I'm trying to build an audience. I write it because I see the value of actually writing for right. my own learning. And so right. I think, I, I don't think this is a, a student thing. I think it's an adult thing. Do we actually mm -hmm. see value in the work that we're doing? And so the, the other thing that I know that we need to get better at, and I'm not saying we as in educate, I'm including myself, is how do you actually start uh, with a place of where people are focused really on what someone does really well and starting from that place, not ignoring their weaknesses, just starting with strengths. And I actually wrote about this in Innovator's Mindset, which I, I thought was fascinating. Years ago, the PISA scores come out uh, in Ontario. And then basically there is a, a news article and it focused on, uh, it, it was interesting because I remember it saying like, uh, scores in literacy in Ontario go up while math goes down, right? Mm. So then I read the article, zero, zero mentions of literacy, none. It's all like, you suck at math, you suck at math, <laughs> you suck at math. And then what happens, what happens with that is then all the superintendents or directors or whatever they're called in Ontario feel this pressure from the public. They like then have to put math into everything. And then they're like, Hey, we suck at math. We suck at math. And the teachers are like, Hey, we suck at math. And then they hammer the kids. We suck at math. We suck at math. Hmm. And, and then it's like, why is everyone feeling so defeated in education? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Oh, cause we are like hearing from every level that we suck. Where yeah. the first thing that I challenged is the first thing that should have came out of that article. And our first inclination should have been, Hey, we're really good at literacy. What are we doing yeah. there? Like, what are we doing there that is actually, so a lot of times when we talk about this strengths-based approach, we mm -hmm. ask our teachers to look for the strengths of our kids while constantly focusing on what they can't do. And right. so there is tons of evidence and research that actually focusing on person's strengths not only makes them better, it actually helps them develop their weaknesses as well. So if you say to me, like, hey, like your, your arms are really ripped, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go work my arms a little bit extra, right? <laughs> like I'm gonna, there's a little, there's a, you know, there's right. a, I wanna like that better, but then I'll, you know, I'm whatever things I do to work out, well, I'll also help my, the entire rest of my body or my cardiovascular system and stuff like that too. But, you know, if you constantly said on all the areas that are, are weak for me, 
you know, you kind of feel deflated and this is what we're doing to our staff. This is what we're doing. So like, how are we actually starting with, you know, places where people feel valued? And I think that yeah. we want this it's for important. our students. We have to focus on how we do this with the people that serve them. Absolutely. And I mean, there's kind of this battle going on nowadays too, right? Like, like content versus like a skills, you know, and getting kids kind of ready for this right. unknown future. Um, what do you think that that we can push a little bit more of the mindset of skill based that those are really really important i mean we talk about them all the time the problem solving and collaboration and but it always seems to be like um trumped by content you know like we got to know stuff yeah how how do you how do you kind of you know straddle those two you know the skills versus content area well, I think, I think even just using the terminology versus is the problem. I think that's one of the, that's one of the things we have to kind of go away from. And I actually, and I don't know if I've ever told this story on video. I, when I wrote innovators mindset, there was a, um, there was a, a parent in our community that was basically, this is right before I wrote it, who is like, innovation is the worst and you're wrecking kids. And like, we need to go back to the basics and all this other stuff. So I was like, oh my God, as soon as my book comes out, she's going to like go after me, <laughs> right? Like she's going to find this book and because it was actually someone in Alberta. So I actually started looking at her stuff and I was like, I actually agree with a lot of what she's saying, but, okay. but what are we leaving out? So for example, like I, I'm known for talking about innovation, but I think basic skills are really important. I actually, I, I, and I might sound like, you know, kind of an old, an, an old timer here. I actually think kids need to know their time tables. Like, I actually mm -hmm. don't think it's the worst thing. I think, and like, I actually, I have no issue with spelling tests. And you know, like the, when people say to me this, well, you know what, uh, kids don't need spell tests because, uh, you know, they have like spell checking. Right. And I'm like, well, you kind of gotta be in the vicinity of the word. Like you gotta be right. a little bit close. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, so I think one of the things that we can do in education, you know, better is that, yes, of course, we want to focus on innovation and actually develop these skills, but also make sure that we don't ignore. And, and I don't think I actually don't think any teachers are ignoring the basics, but we we ignore we ignore talking about it with our communities and talk about mm -hmm. this and saying, like, hey, these are things that we are really focusing on to, so that we can get, so for example, hey, we want kids to be able to read and write so that eventually they, ha they have, the, they, they have the, the ability and interest to actually end up writing a book, right? Mm -hmm. But what we often mm -hmm. talk about is just writing the book and, the, and then you're like, well, kids can't even read and write. It's like, no, no, no. So we forgot to share this really important part. So the analogy that I make with this oftentimes, because I, I don't, I think, and like I work with a lot of high school people and they really appreciate this because, you know, high school is very content heavy. And mm -hmm. then they're like, hey, you, and they're like, well, you know what? We get tested on content. So you can say whatever you want, but we still get tested on this. So the analogy yeah. that I use all the time is that if you think of the best jazz musicians in the world, how what they're known for is their ability to improvise, that they can like make they can read what's going on, you know, with with their colleagues um, as they're playing music and they'll just start changing stuff on the fly. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you can go to the same, you know, band, you know, five nights in a row and it'll be totally different based on the mood of the room and stuff like this, but their ability to improvise, their ability to create on the fly is because they know the basics of their instrument inside out. And so that I think is where we kind of have to kind of go away from this because we, we do, we have, we, and I'm part of, I, I'm trying not to be part of this problem, but I, I was. <laughs> is that it was like the basics versus innovation as opposed to we actually have to have our kids understand the basics so they can do those innovative things and right. they can go to this right and you know like a lot of stuff with ai i i do have concerns that um you're like i saw someone posting like hey you have this uh this thing and it will create your curriculum for you and like it will save you so much time and i'm like oh that's great so i can just fire the curriculum department and then pay 9.99 <laughs> a month and have it and so like you know what do we bring to the table and so one of the things that i've really been focusing on is how do we actually create schools where students learn to attain knowledge so that they can develop wisdom and uh one of my favorite quotes and this is like an unknown quote is that you know knowledge 
is understanding that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is understanding that a tomato would be terrible in a fruit salad. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's great, a that's cool. a great way to yeah, look at it. Works. It. That's a great way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. For so, sure, for so sure. So that I think it's I think I think that we have to get away from this either or or versus, but saying like, yeah, these things are really important. And Yang Zhao, and I went on forever. Yang Zhao basically said in a sentence, he said, "Reading and writing should be the floor, not the ceiling." And I think that that's the mentality that I'm trying to embrace with this. I love that. I love that. I love your analogy too. That's a great one. Um, yeah, yeah, it's helpful. <laughs> no, I wish yeah. it was mine. I was, this is mine. Yeah, so but I think, I, I think it does make such a good point. When I heard, it, I was like, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." Yeah, yeah. makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Uh, George, what about? I, I I was reading some of what you were talking about about digital leadership. So kind of yeah. the innovations we have, and how do you get people going in the same direction because technology will never stop, right? It's always going to be there. It's always going to be in the conversation or it should be. Um, But how do you get, how do you lead people towards innovation um, to support their uh, student learning? Yeah. So I I think for me, like people ask us forever, just because of the work that I do and what I write about, they'll say like, what do you, what do you see happening in five years? And Mm -hmm. If you asked me this question five years ago, and if you ask me this question five years from now, my answer will be exactly the same. I have no clue and neither do you. And so that is actually like, we have to embrace this. When everyone calls themselves a, a, like a futurist, I'm like, whatever. You're like, you're just, you're selling something, right? So like, I'm a little leery of that. Um, but for me, the, the focus is, I, I, so there is a part two to that. I have no clue. And neither do you, but the part two is, yep. but whatever comes my way, I'll figure it out. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. like I go back to the beginning of this podcast that was instilled in me right away is like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to teach this, but I'm going to figure it out. And that might mean me going in an hour early. That might mean me asking the students who seem to know this way better than me and I'm teaching it, but whatever. And so like <laughs> tapping into people that, you know, bring different knowledge as well. So I think the, the mentality is how do you develop schools that truly empower students so they don't need the teacher, they don't need this. And so, you know, going back to what we talked about with professional learning experiences, um, mm-hmm. a lot of times what we do is we create dependent teachers. Like we've done like, Hey, here's this app, go to file, go to new. And we step by step and like half the teachers are like, are you kidding me? Like, this is such a waste of time. I know how to do this. <laughs> and then 30% of like other teachers are saying, you know, like, okay, seriously, like this guy's going too fast. I can go as slow as possible. It's too fast. And then 20% are like, I don't care. I'm retiring. So I'm just going to sit through this. So what I try to focus on is I'll show people I'll like, Hey, here's this thing. I don't show them how to use it. I try to show value. And then you try to create where if they see value, they're more wor- likely to learn it. But we, right. we do the step-by-step tutorial, but we don't actually show what the value is, right? So you know how to use it. You just don't know why you ever would. So right. I think that's, we have to kind of start getting people to, to see value in the things that we're doing, why this is important, that they want to learn it on their own. And that, that ultimately is the best thing you can do for your students and yourself. That whatever comes your way, you'll figure it out, right? Like, uh, I was at, we're learning piano. Uh, my daughter, so I'm 48 and my daughter's seven. I bought a piano for Christmas. We're both learning at the same time. And I want to learn alongside with her. And uh, we downloaded an app, started using it. And I'm sitting on the TV and, or I'm sitting watching TV and she's playing piano. And she said, dad, Hey, like, I, I don't know how to get to this. I'm like, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to like press buttons until you figure it out. <laughs> Cause I, I've never used the app either. So right. like I'm, I'm doing nothing different than you. And we have to be comfortable to say to our kids. Yeah. You figure it out. Like, I'm not going to show you everything because then what do you do? If you, if I get up, and then I do it all for her and I like walk her through. Then she learns the next time she gets just call over dad. I'm like, nah, so you figure it out. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever, you know what I'm going to do? What you're going to do, press <laughs> buttons until it works. So That's right. yeah. And then, so like, we That's have to cool. be comfortable. We have to be comfortable with that too. Right. Cause I, I'm, like I said, it's, it was a brand new app to me. So, and she, she's, she, she know, like, it's funny because she knows like, yeah, if I, if, 
if he doesn't know and I don't know, then we're in the same position and I, I know how to learn it. And that's what I'm yep. trying to teach my kids. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that it, it, it always comes back to the learning aspect, right? And, yep. and it, teachers being students, you know, you always kind of pushing yourself forward, uh, continuously. Yep. Um, well, George, I want to thank you for this. It's been, uh, it's, it's, it's a fast podcast, but man, a lot of ideas were shared um, so. in this short time. I really appreciate your words and uh, some of your quotes and uh, people out there. If you haven't read any of George's books, you better do it because they're amazing. Um, and thanks for popping in uh, from sunny Florida. Envy is still in my body, but uh, I'll try to get over it. Well, the, the sunshine, you know, the sunshine inspires these ideas, right? <laughs> right. That's what happens. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks so much, Chris. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for, thanks. thanks for having me on, Chris.